Hi everyone, my name is Jennifer Wang and I'm a dermatologist at Stanford University. Thank you for the opportunity today to speak a little bit about skin cancer and provide some education to the community about skin cancer diagnosis, treatment, and most importantly, prevention. I practice at a site where we see many patients who have had a history of CF um, and some of them go on to have a lung transplant afterward. And skin cancer becomes an issue for many of them at some point along the way. So this would be a good opportunity to review what it's like to be diagnosed with skin cancer, understand a little bit about the diagnosis of skin cancer um, and ways that you can continue to live your life without having to worry about this or have it negatively affect you. So this talk is called Skin Cancer 101, how to spot it, how to treat it, and how to beat it. Today, we'll focus on a couple of questions. First, how common is skin cancer? What are some risk factors for skin cancer? What does skin cancer look like? How is skin cancer treated? And finally, how can I protect myself from skin cancer? So how common is skin cancer? Skin cancer is actually one of the most frequently diagnosed cancers in the world. And we can categorize skin cancers in two main groups, the non-melanoma skin cancers, which are commonly called keratinocyte cancers based on the type of cell in the skin that they derive from. And the two main groups of these non-melanoma skin cancers are basal cell cancer and squamous cell cancer, which I'll abbreviate BCC and SCC through the rest of this talk. Melanoma skin cancers are another major type of skin cancer that we hear a lot about because they do have a tendency to act more aggressively and potentially spread to other parts of the body. There are many other types of more rare skin cancers that we won't be getting to during this talk today, but these are the two main groups that we hear about when we talk about skin cancer. To get a sense of how common some of these skin cancers are, it's interesting that in many cancer registries, non-melanoma skin cancers, such as our basal cell cancer and our squamous cell cancers are not actually tracked because they are so common and people often do very well so they have not been included as part of the cancer registry. According to one study in the United States in 2019, there were an estimated 2.8 million new cases of basal cell cancer, 1.5 million new cases of squamous cell cancer, and 82,000 new cases of melanoma. As you can see in this chart from the study, the incidence rate per 100,000 persons of the three different cancers is shown, with basal cell cancer in red being the most common skin cancer, squamous cell cancer in green being the second most common, and melanoma at the bottom. To give you a sense of scale of how many skin cancers there are diagnosed each year, in 2022, an estimated 290,000 new cases of breast cancer 268,000 new cases of prostate cancer, 236,000 new cases of lung cancer, and 151,000 new cases of colon cancer will be diagnosed. In fact, melanoma is the fifth most common type of cancer diagnosed in the United States, but this doesn't include basal cell and squamous cell because as you can see, the numbers of those far exceeds these other types of cancers. Many of you were probably wondering, what is the mortality of these skin cancers? Well, the good news is that the mortality does remain relatively low. Melanoma, as you can see in this chart, has a higher mortality rate than squamous cell cancer. This chart represents mortality rate per 100,000 persons. And for melanoma, which is shown in blue, it was 2.2 deaths per 100,000 persons per year. Squamous cell cancer, had 0.8 deaths per 100,000 persons per year, according to this study. Mortality rates of basal cell cancer remain quite low, and in this particular study was actually zero. So this is actually relatively good news, and we would like to continue to improve skin cancer mortality rates over the years. 
I don't want to focus on the negatives of skin cancer. And I do want to bring attention to this statistic that in 2019, an estimated 1.3 million people were living with melanoma in the United States. And so this goes to show that if caught early and treated early, skin cancer can have an excellent outcome and can be very beatable and you can continue to live your life without having to worry about negative consequences. So what are some risk factors for skin cancer? Some of the most common and important risk factors for skin cancer include a history of exposure to UV radiation. And this is either from sun and excessive sun exposure through sun tanning, outdoor activities, or even through artificial UV sources such as tanning beds. Light skin color, light hair color, and light eye color may also put you at higher risk for skin cancer, as may older age or male sex. Having someone in your family have skin cancer, or you personally having had a skin cancer in the past, may also increase your risk of future skin cancers. Relevant to the CF community and those who have undergone lung transplantation, certain genetic factors and immune suppression may also increase your risk of skin cancer. One Swedish study found that non-melanoma skin cancer, again, basal cell cancer and squamous cell cancer, was 23 times more common in CF patients compared to the general population. Interestingly, first degree relatives of CF patients were not found to have this increased skin cancer risk, suggesting that maybe something about the CF mutation puts people at higher risk for skin cancer. As you can see in this table from this study, CF patients were also at increased risk for other types of cancers, not just of the skin. In lung transplant patients, we see a similar increased risk of skin cancer. One study noted that the skin cancer incidence increases as each year after transplant goes by. At five years, shown at the orange arrow, the percent of patients with skin cancer after five years was 31% for any type of skin cancer. For squamous cell, it was 28%, and for basal cell, it was 12%. Compare this to 10 years after transplant, where nearly half of all transplant patients developed a new skin cancer. 42% of them had squamous cell, and 21% of those were basal cell cancers. So it's very important to continue monitoring your skin as time goes by after transplant, because the risk seems to increase with time. What are some potential risk factors for skin cancer that are specific to the CF and lung transplant population? Well, as we saw in the last slide, CF patients seem to be at an overall increased risk of cancer, not just skin cancer. Additionally, exposure to certain medications, including this one called voriconazole, may increase sun sensitivity and your skin cancer risk. Voriconazole is an antifungal drug often used in CF patients and also in the lung transplant community. Lung transplants compared to other solid organ transplants also require heavier types of immunosuppression compared to, for example, kidney transplants or liver transplants. And having a weakened immune system can make it difficult for your body to fight and detect cancer. So these may be some particular reasons why we see increased cancer in the CF and lung transplant community. When it comes to early detection for skin cancer, it's helpful to know what skin cancer looks like. So we'll go through a couple images here of the different types of skin cancer and talk about some risk factors or features that you can look out for when you're trying to see if your skin may be at risk. So this is an example of basal cell carcinoma, which again is the most common type of skin cancer. Basal cell cancers often start as a smooth pink bump. Some people describe it as a pimple or a sore or a bug bite that just wasn't healing over time. As you can see in these photos, many of them develop an open wound in the middle with a scab. Sometimes they bleed if they're touched or rubbed. And many people notice that these growths are slow growing over time. Sometimes the basal cell cancers are much more subtle as shown in that lower right picture and are just a red or pink patch on the skin that maybe has been getting larger over time, maybe is painful, maybe bleeds occasionally, or maybe it's something that the dermatologist picked up um, that the patient may not have noticed because again, sometimes these can be very, very subtle and slow growing. 
Squamous cell cancers can sometimes be difficult to tell apart from basal cell cancers. Usually, they look like a rough, scaly bump, and they may grow slowly like basal cell cancers. Sometimes, however, they may also grow very rapidly. There is one version of squamous cell cancer called a keratoacanthoma that often shows up over the course of weeks, looks like a little volcano on the skin, and can be very, very disturbing to people because it just showed up out of nowhere. Sometimes squamous cell cancers can also be painful if they start to invade deeper into the skin and involve structures such as nerves or blood vessels. This is usually a sign of a more advanced skin cancer, so it's something that you definitely want to bring to your doctor's attention if you're noticing something like this. As you can see in the lower right-hand photo, sometimes these skin cancers are not very obvious, and it may just show up as a red, sore spot that doesn't heal or go away with time. So just like basal cell cancers, anything that's growing, changing, or doesn't seem normal for a normal scratch, bug bite, or pimple should be something that you have someone take a look at to make sure it's not an early skin cancer that's developing. The next cancer we'll talk about is melanoma skin cancer, which is um, not as common as squamous cell or basal cell cancer, but as we saw from the charts earlier, has a higher mortality rate. Melanoma usually shows up as a dark, irregular mole or spot. Sometimes it develops from a pre-existing mole, but the majority of melanoma skin cancers actually show up out of the blue. You can recognize them by their dark, irregular color. Oftentimes a spot will have multiple different shades of brown or black contained within it. Um, sometimes it'll even have red or pink or white as part of the coloration. Melanomas may appear asymmetric in shape, meaning one half doesn't look like the other half. As you can see in these photos, you cannot draw a line through the middle of each spot and have the other half look like the other half. Melanoma skin cancers may often grow or change with time. Sometimes this is a slow growth over many years. Other times it's more obvious developing over the course of only a couple of months. There is a useful mnemonic to help detect signs of melanoma skin cancer called A, B, C, D, E. Each of these stands for a specific feature of a melanoma skin cancer that should prompt um, medical attention. A stands for asymmetry, meaning one half doesn't look like the other. B stands for borders being irregular or jagged, unlike being round and smooth like a normal mole. C stands for uneven color. D stands for diameter larger than six millimeters. And E stands for evolution or change over time. Another helpful feature is what we call the ugly duckling sign, meaning that this mole stands out from the rest of them like an ugly duckling. As you can see in that lower photo, this particular mole was much larger and much darker than the background moles and freckles. So this was a sign that this spot was not normal. And in fact, when biopsied, it did show a melanoma skin cancer. So now that we've talked a little bit about what skin cancer looks like, let's talk more about how skin cancer is treated. So skin cancer is typically treated by surgery, whether it's a squamous cell, basal cell, or melanoma skin cancer. Standard excision involves cutting out the area with the skin cancer and usually taking a margin of normal skin around the cancer to ensure that it's completely removed. This usually involves local anesthesia and a few stitches in the skin to close the wound. Generally, that piece of tissue that was removed is then sent to the laboratory to ensure that the surgery has fully removed the skin cancer with clean margins. In some scenarios, Mohs surgery may be offered as a treatment. This is very common for squamous cell cancers, basal cell cancers, and a select few type of melanoma skin cancers. Mohs surgery is a special technique where the surgeon will remove only small pieces of tissue at a time and check under the microscope in real time while you're still there in the office to make sure that they're completely around the skin cancer. If they were not able to clear the margin, they will continue to go back and take small pieces at a time until they can confirm that the skin cancer has been completely removed. This surgery has the benefit of keeping the wound as small as possible, 
which is important for areas on the body, such as the face, ears, fingers, or lower leg, where there may not be a lot of excess skin to move around and close a large wound compared to your back or your chest or your abdomen, where there's a lot more tissue to pull together to sew up a wound. Most surgery also offers the benefit of ensuring that the margins are completely clear at time of surgery so that if the complicated repair needs to be done, you can be confident that the cancer is all out. These are the most common ways to treat skin cancer. But for certain types of skin cancer that are more superficial, other treatment options may become available. For example, superficial basal cell cancers or superficial squamous cell cancers may be treated with a topical cream that can penetrate just the top layer of skin and kill off the cancerous cells. Another treatment option is a procedure called electrodesiccation and curatage, where in the office, the physician or treating provider may scrape away the area of skin cancer and cauterize the area of tissue to destroy the cancer more completely. Each of these options has their pros and their cons. So it's important that if you are going to be treated for skin cancer, you ask your questions to make sure that the provider is providing you with the option that's right for you and for your cancer. For other cancers that are more advanced, sometimes additional treatment beyond surgery is needed. For example, for melanoma skin cancers that are deeper under the skin or that are more aggressive appearing, there may be a secondary procedure called a sentinel lymph node biopsy in which the surgeon may actually remove a lymph node to check to make sure that cancer hasn't moved into the lymph nodes beyond the skin. In other cases, for example, squamous cell cancers that have also become more advanced or deeper in the skin, it's possible that you may need a course of radiation to again, make sure that all the cancer cells have been fully removed. These situations don't come up often. And certainly if a skin cancer is treated early when it's small and hasn't had a chance to progress to that advanced stage, you may not need these additional treatments. So now that we've talked about skin cancer treatment, let's talk about how you can protect yourself against skin cancer in the first place so that you wouldn't necessarily have to go through some of these surgical treatments that we talked about. Most important to protect yourself against skin cancer is UV protection. So again, UV radiation is most commonly derived from the sun, but also there are artificial sources such as tanning beds. For sun exposure, simple practices include avoiding uh, prolonged activities during midday where the sun or the UV index is highest, staying in the shade as much as possible, or using some sort of shade cover like an umbrella or a porch cover or you know, sitting under a tree instead of being out in direct sunlight. As I mentioned, tanning bed use is also a major contributor to UV radiation. And we're seeing a lot of new skin cancers in younger people these days because of tanning bed use. Tanning beds were categorized as a human carcinogen by the WHO, the World Health Organization in 2009 and its use by minors has actually been banned in 22 states and in the District of Columbia. So if you're using a tanning bed, I would recommend stopping this practice to keep your skin healthy and avoid skin cancer in the future. Finally, I don't want to give the impression that you need to live inside a box and not ever go outside and enjoy your life and enjoy outdoor activities again. As long as you stay protected from the sun in smart ways, you can still continue doing the things you enjoy. Sun protective clothing can play a very important role in protecting your skin from UV damage. And this would be anything from hats, long sleeve shirts, or clothing that has UV protection factor or UPF built into the material. If you were to use a hat, I would recommend a hat with a large brim that goes all the way around the edges um, to protect the tops of your ears and the back of your neck which are areas that often get sunburned and you don't really think about covering or protecting them with sunscreen, which we'll get to in a little bit. As you can see in the middle photo, there are now hats that have a cover or a flap in the back to protect the back of your neck. And these will be really helpful if you're outdoors for a long period of time. 
for example, at the beach or hiking, where it may be inconvenient to continue applying sunscreen or perhaps too hot to wear a long sleeve turtleneck shirt that's gonna really protect your neck. Speaking of long sleeved clothing, swim shirts have also increased in popularity. These are made of materials that you can enter the water with and they'll provide coverage for all exposed areas so you can still enjoy things like swimming, being out on the beach, surfing, etc., without having to worry about getting burned, um, being in the water too long. There are many companies and brands that make these particular types of clothing. Um, any one of them, I think, is uh, a reasonable option, and really it depends on your price budget, um, your fashion taste, and there's many options if you were just to look online and do some shopping that you can find things in very affordable ranges. The materials are often made for outdoor activities, so they're breathable and lightweight, um, and they are becoming more and more stylish over the years. So I do recommend looking into that if you're gonna plan a trip to somewhere tropical or you know, do if you're into outdoor activities, um, this would be a good purchase that will go a long way for a long time. Let's talk a little bit about sunscreen because we hear a lot about sunscreen and what to use, but um, there's a lot of information out there that can make sunscreen seem a little overwhelming. Many of my patients ask me what is the best brand of sunscreen or a good brand to use. And I like to tell them that the best brand is the one that you will actually put on your skin and that you'll use every day. So I can recommend a particular brand or product, but if it's not available where you live, you can't find it in the store, it's out of your price range, or you just don't like the texture or the smell, you're never gonna put it on your skin and that's not gonna do you any, um, serve you any good. So some basics about sunscreen that you should look for. The American Academy of Dermatology has published a handout that this um, infographic is taken from. And the key features of sunscreen are listed here. First, the sunscreen should say that it's broad spectrum, meaning that it covers both radiation from the UVA and UVB portions of the UV spectrum. These are the rays that can cause skin cancer, so it's important that your sunscreen cover both the UVA and UVB rays. Most sunscreens, I believe, should cover both of these um, these days. The SPF number is also a really important thing to look for, and you want to aim for an SPF factor of 30 or higher. Higher number means that it will last longer before you are at risk of burning, but this, this assumes that you will be applying the correct amount of sunscreen on. Many people, in fact, most people, underapply sunscreen. So I usually have patients aim for a slightly higher number, such as SPF 50, because if you underapply, then hopefully you're still getting at least an SPF 30 level of protection. Many makeup and cosmetic products may say that have some sunscreen built in, but oftentimes the sunscreen in those products or the SPF rating in those products is lower, such as 15 or 20. So in those situations, if you do plan to be out for a long period of time, I think using a sunscreen in addition to what's in the cosmetic product would help best protect you from sunscreen. And how to apply this, probably put the regular sunscreen on first, let that dry, and then you can use your foundation or cover up over that. If you're gonna be planning to be in the water, many sunscreens now say water resistant or very water resistant. And this is important because you don't want to be in the swimming pool and have your sunscreen wash off and be at risk for sunburning. So water resistant sunscreen will last longer in the pool, meaning that you'll be protected for a longer period of time. The type of sunscreen or sunscreen format doesn't really make a difference either. There's lotions, there's sunscreen sprays and sunscreen sticks, plus probably other formats that I'm not even aware of yet. So if using a spray or a stick, just be sure that you cover the entire area of skin thoroughly and you don't miss an area. It's like painting a wall. If you're gonna use spray paint, make sure the paint covers everything so that you don't have a spot that went unexposed or when you use a paint roller, make sure that you cover all the areas so there's not a stripe down the middle of your back that got unprotected and then you end up with a sunburn right there. It's also important when using sunscreen lotions to use enough. One ounce of sunscreen is meant to cover all the exposed areas of the body. One ounce is enough to fill a shot glass. 
So if you think about it, that's actually quite a lot of sunscreen to apply all over the body. So as you can imagine, many of us are probably under applying our sunscreen. So it's important to use enough and also to reapply every two hours, because if you are in the pool, sweating a lot and wiping down your skin, you're probably wiping away your sunscreen too. Now, there have been some recent controversies regarding sunscreen. For example, one study that received some publicity about two years ago was that chemical sunscreen components such as avobenzone and oxybenzone have been found in low levels in the bloodstream, meaning they're getting absorbed through the skin into the blood. There are still studies underway to determine whether or not the presence of these compounds in the blood has any sort of long-term health issues or health um, consequences, but those studies are still underway and their significance is still to be determined. If you're at all concerned about this, I would look for physical sunscreens or mineral sunscreens. These products contain compounds such as zinc oxide and titanium dioxide, and those particles being actual minerals are too large to be absorbed through the skin. So they're generally recognized as safe. The downside of physical sunscreens is that they're often a little bit pastier and a little bit more opaque when you apply them to your skin. So as long as you don't mind having a little bit of a white sheen on your face when wearing these physical sunscreens, um, they may be a safer alternative if you're at all concerned about the possibility of the chemical sunscreens being absorbed into your skin. The chemical sunscreens may also um, cause some issues for people who have very sensitive skin. Um, they're more likely to cause problems with allergic reactions. So if you're someone who tends to react to many different products, the physical or mineral sunscreens may be an easier option for you to use. They're often marketed as sunscreen for sensitive skin, sunscreen for baby, and just be sure to flip the, to the back of the bottle and look at the actual ingredient list to see what it contains. Zinc oxide and titanium dioxide are the physical or mineral compounds that you want to look for. Additionally, in summer 2021, there was a recall on certain sunscreens that contained benzene. Most of these were sunscreen sprays, and many of them have already been pulled from the market, if not all of them. Again, studies are underway to determine what the health consequences of this is, and one study saw that sunscreen use was not associated with increased blood levels of benzene. However, if all of this makes you worried or anxious about sunscreen and potentially what it can do for your body, just remember that sunscreen is not the only way to protect yourself with the sun. Clothing, hats, picking in the right time of day can also minimize your exposure to harmful UV rays. So using some of the other techniques that we talked about, um, if you're worried about sunscreen and potential dangers of sunscreen, um, is still a good way for you to um, protect your skin. Finally, in addition to you know, avoiding UV radiation or sun exposure, just being aware of your skin can play a big important role in detecting skin cancer early. Regular skin examinations can be performed by your primary care doctor during an annual physical exam, or if you want to establish with a dermatologist, they can also help you with routine exams. For many of my patients who have undergone a transplant, this is something that is worked in with their transplant team as part of their post-transplant surveillance. Any dermatologist should be properly trained to detect and screen for skin cancer. Um, and if this is not something that you already are doing, I would suggest talking to your transplant team to see if there's a dermatologist that they've worked with or who's in your network or near you that you can start to see in order to screen and detect these for these skin cancers. But I wouldn't just rely on going to the doctor's office for you to check for skin cancer. Many skin cancers are actually first picked up by the patient themselves. I'll have many people come in and say, hey, there's been a spot here that's been bleeding, it's been growing, it's been painful, and we do a biopsy to sample it, and sure enough, it shows a skin cancer. So very important to also just be aware of what's happening on your body. Uh, monthly self-skin checks can be helpful to detect anything that's new or unusual or changing. This doesn't have to be done every single month, but maybe every two or three months can be helpful to detect change. For areas of the body that are difficult for you to, to look at, you can ask a trusted family member or a friend to help you take a glance at your back. You can use a mirror. 
Um, and photos on smartphones can also be very helpful for you to know if something has changed over time. People with many moles or many spots may find it difficult to know if any particular one of these moles has changed or grown over time. And that's where a photo can be very helpful because our memories often fail us. If you're already seeing a dermatologist, ask them if niacinamide supplements may be something helpful for you. Niacinamide is a vitamin B derivative that was studied a few years ago and found to reduce the risk of non-melanoma skin cancers or pre-cancer lesions. Um, and it's very safe and available over the counter, but because any sort of supplement has the potential to interact with other supplements or medications that you may be taking, I would ask your doctor about this first before um, purchasing it. It is available over the counter. It's also under the name nicotinamide, but again, check with your doctor first if this is something that would be right for you. Finally, I just want to emphasize that walking away from today, I hope you feel you'll feel empowered by the knowledge and that you don't need to live in fear of this. This is a quote from one of my patients who has CF and underwent a lung transplant and has been dealing with skin cancer um, ever since uh, transplant. And it's something that's very, very manageable. And as long as you're making the right lifestyle changes and choices and following up with your doctors on a regular basis, um, this is something that we can manage and deal with. Um, it's very rare for skin cancers to progress to the point where they are difficult to treat and they cause um, great harm or death. And we certainly don't want that to happen. So part of our roles as dermatologists is to make sure that people are educated and aware of what we need to do to take care of our skin um, so that if there is a problem, we can catch it early. And of course, prevention is very important too. So bottom line take home message is skin cancer is something that may come up and may affect many of us, even if we aren't someone who has CF or who's been through a transplant, but because it is more common in these uh, populations, um, something that we just need to be aware of and know how to take care of. To learn more about skin cancer and what to expect um, with the skin cancer diagnosis or how to protect your skin, um, these are some websites that are very helpful and have um, information for the general public about the different types of skin cancers. Uh, the American Academy of Dermatology also has handouts or flyers and posters that you can print out as a reference for yourself or for family members or friends who are going through um, skin cancer treatment. Um, and of course, the Skin Cancer Foundation, American Cancer Society, and National Cancer Institute are other great resources for learning more about skin cancer. So with that, I thank you for your attention, and I hope this answers some of your questions about skin cancer, um, skin cancer prevention, um, and what to expect uh, for the years to come in terms of taking care of your skin and catching a cancer diagnosis early. Thank you for your time.